All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, for, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to kick things off with a few remarks, and we're going to hear from Samantha Dunn, who is our assistant director for community works uh, within the Encino and has really been the builder of, uh, of this uh, facility in a lot of ways. Um, then we will hear from Brian Pine, uh, the Encino director, and then Michael Monti, our key partner here at Champlain Housing Trust, executive director. Um, and then we'll take some questions, and then we, Samantha, will um, be able to lead a, a tour of uh, some of the some of the facility. So, with that kind of roadmap, here we go. Um, thank you for joining us today, and, and those of you who've been here before on this uh, site, welcome back. We're here to welcome you to the now complete Elmwood Emergency Shelter Community before guests arrive to occupy, occupy these new 35 beds and the common facilities that we're, we're standing in. Um, the, uh, the, as you can see, the, the community is now um, done and we will soon be um, moving people in, um, in phases and we expect to be uh, fully occupied by the end of the month. Elmwood was first conceived and has been built to serve as a temporary, critical resource in our ongoing efforts to bring a functional end to homelessness and to deliver on the promise of housing as a human right here in Burlington. While the innovations here, um, sort of, there's been a lot of discussion about the kind of physical innovation here, the use of these very small structures, pods as some people call them, that's, that's really just a small piece of, of the innovation that this project represents. <clears throat> the way in which this shelter is going to be operated and the services that are going to be provided here in a centralized way are also important innovations. Residents in this low barrier shelter will have greater independence and ability to manage their lives here than is possible in congregate shelters. In addition, here at Elmwood, homeless community members will have access to numerous services and supports under one roof from recovery services to basic needs to healthcare and mental health support and visits from caseworkers and housing navigators that are focused on helping residents move as quickly as possible into permanent housing. Um, in short, with this shelter, we are taking a new public health approach to homelessness. I also wanna speak a little bit to the broader context uh, around the city's work to end homelessness that this is a piece of. With the opening of Elmwood, combined with the recent expansion to the city-supported shelter, um, known as the, the, a new place is operating, we have nearly doubled the city's capacity for low barrier emergency shelter beds over the last year, down from about 50 to just short of 100. While the, the sun is shining today, our experience over the last week in delivering a rapid response to the extreme cold weather across New England has only sharpened our feelings as a city team that there is great urgency to deliver this critical new resource of supportive emergency shelter to our community. Um, just last week, as some of you surely know, the city uh, took a really a unusual step for the city and with uh, particular leadership from CETO and support from the State Agency of Human Services and the Red Cross, an emergency shelter, uh, emergency cold weather shelter was set up at the Miller Center in the, in the New North End which serviced 60 individuals, uh, separate, unique individuals overnight between Thursday and Saturday as the wind chill brought the temperatures outside to more than 30 below zero. In part, those efforts to operate the city's first ever overnight cold weather shelter was successful because of the significant work already underway to prepare for the opening of this facility. The Howard Center outreach staff, our CSLs, and the housing navigators and caseworkers involved in Chittenden County coordinated entry were critical in reaching the unsheltered and vulnerable neighborhoods and quickly, to quickly inform them uh, in a, of this new facility that was at the Miller Center to encourage them to take refuge there. That work and the more than year-long effort to realize this new facility illustrates clearly that delivering housing as a human right is a community-wide endeavor and that this is an all-hands-on-deck moment. 
I'm thankful to the many partners, including the city staff from numerous departments, neighbors, local businesses, countless vendors on the uh, design build team, and the numerous service providers who brought us to this moment and will be critical to the future success at the Elm, of this Elmwood community. <clears throat> Since I announced in late 2022 an action plan to fill housing as a human right in Burlington, uh, where we first kind of laid out this concept of a new 35 bed low barrier shelter, two people in particular have worked uh, enormously to, to make this possible. And uh, I again want to thank Samantha for her, her leadership in the physical uh, development efforts, and I want to thank Sarah Russell, our, our special assistant to end homelessness, for um, uh, her efforts to bring the program and details uh, into being today. Uh, Sarah was also the driving force behind the city's efforts at the Miller Center during the cold weather emergency, so she could not be with us today, but her skills, experience, and the commitment to the mission of ending homelessness in Burlington has helped shape the city's public health approach to serving the unsheltered, and uh, I'm very grateful for, for the leadership of both Samantha and Sarah. So with that, I will now turn over the podium uh, to Samantha to share um, some more details. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've been thinking about how to create this new community um, every day for more than a year since the mayor announced the 10-point housing plan to ensure housing as a human right in the city of Burlington. Creating high quality, dignified shelter with access to safety, security, and services as quickly as possible has been a huge challenge and one that is worth losing sleep over, which has happened. To realize um, this community on this aggressive timeline, we took an innovative approach to use the city-owned property, um, free, prefabricated uh, buildings, and really relied on putting together a team of hundreds of individuals that have contributed um, to this facility being where it is today. Just as a reminder, in February of last year, uh, less than a year ago, the City Council actually approved use of uh, ARPA funds to, to make this community a reality. And then the next month, the uh, Public Works Commission and then the City Council again uh, gave us permission to use this site for three years for this emergency shelter. Um, and at the end of July, we received our conditional use zoning permit, which allowed us to actually start working. Every step of this project has taken longer than I wanted to. And some of that has been due to the regular construction challenges of unknown underground storage tanks under, <laughs> under a parking lot, supply chain and labor issues. Um, but the real reason um, that the need is that the need for this project to open is so acute. And so that every day the shelter uh, wasn't open was interminable for me. And tomorrow, that will end. We will um, welcome, or CHT will welcome the first guests to this community, and I think that's something uh, that we should, you know, give a round of applause to CHT for stepping up to do that, and to everyone um, who has brought us this part. I do, I am gonna go through a long list of people um, to thank because I have the deepest gratitude um, for everyone that has helped us get here today and I, I've gotta take the time to mention them. Of course, the City of Burlington's ARPA funding. We also have special funding from the Burlington Electric Department that allows this facility to be a fossil fuel facility um, and to invest in um, high performance buildings with high performance mechanical systems. On top of that funding, we got uh, special funding from the Vermont Low Income Trust for electricity. Um, you've got solar panels on both of these buildings. They will produce more energy than they use. Um, and funding from the Vermont Community Foundation that will contribute to um, the community building spaces on the site. Our design and construction team, with special thanks to Duncan Wisniewski Architecture and Peter Schneider at VEIC, who really helped me from day one to imagine uh, how we could create a community on a really rough parking lot. Um, and then of Bob Peters of Second Gen Builders and Sue Cobb of Redbird Integrated Consulting, who have poured their hearts and souls 
uh, into this space day after day, weekend after weekend, uh, all night on Friday and Saturday night. Um, but our whole design and construction team also includes able paint, glass and flooring, Atlas uh, Environmental, BP Wastewater, Bronson Johnson Seamless Gutters, Burlington Electric Department, Burlington Telecom, Burlington Water Department, Elizabeth Emmett, Goliath Tech, Gordon's Window Decor, Harvestar Power, Intuitive Engineering, KBS Builders, Lakeside Electric, Liza Phillip, Pallet Shelters, Peters Consulting, Pilmaharam Architects, Redbird Integrated Consulting, Red Rock Mechanical, Round Hill Fence, True Engineering, Up and This, US Ecology, Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, Vermont Security, and Youth Build, as well as all of the volunteers that help paint the pavement and the shelters. Finally, we had um, donations from Minotaur, so one of our pieces of uh, high uh, quality mechanical system was donated by Minotaur. Um, American Floor Mats donated a doormat for every shelter. We have um, donations from Sherman Williams, Farmhouse Group, Homeport, Northgate Apartment Residents and Staff, and the First Unitarian Universalist Society of Burlington. So again, um, Thank you for allowing me to name all those folks who actually made this possible. I'm going to pass it to Brian Pine. Thanks, Samantha. I want to just say that um, the mayor has provided the leadership and the support, and Samantha has been the primary driver behind the development of this project. So without her, we wouldn't actually be celebrating uh, or not celebrating, I should say, but at least uh, honoring the opening of a shelter. Shelter is a bit of an odd thing to celebrate, right? Because it's acknowledging that we have a need, the can, need continues that we take care of folks for whom the housing uh, market and the system is not working. So it's um, in some ways a bit of a um, bittersweet moment in that way. Uh, as the mayor said, the, this shelter is really based on the idea that we can uh, end homelessness with a comprehensive public health approach with a special emphasis on both the mental health and physical health needs of folks who are experiencing homelessness. And I just want to note that um, this effort, this drive to end homelessness, among some has sort of taken on a bit of an anti-shelter tone where people say shelter isn't the solution, housing's the solution. And it's actually both and, unfortunately. It's actually, there are people today, 80 of whom wanted to live here. Not 80 folks are going to get to live here. We're actually going to be able to house 35 people. So just to give you some sense of scale, the need is, is intense. But in order for shelter to play the vital role in leading to, to permanent housing and housing stability, uh, we need to maintain a sort of constant, unending focus on what supports people need to move into permanent housing. It's the services, it's the subsidies, and it's the permanent housing itself. And so those, uh, that three-legged stool is critical, but shelter should not be viewed in, in, as, as an unnecessary part of that equation. Um, the idea here is that at one facility, under one roof that we're all under right now, guests who are staying here at the shelter will have access to services and programs that they previously may have had to schlep all across Burlington or maybe even outside of Burlington to have access to. The goal being that there are those who, for whatever reason, trauma, other barriers in their lives make them resistant to accessing services. When it's here, when it's available day in and day out, when people that you begin to trust and establish relationships with are reminding you and offering you this assistance. The theory here, the theory of change is critical, is that folks will be willing to take that step. They'll be willing to, to overcome their barriers, their own personal barriers that are keeping them from having stable housing. So we're looking for uh, a really, um, you know, sort of game-changing um, approach here for folks. And I just want to note some of the sources of support we've gotten that, that I think deserve to be highlighted, as well as our partners are going to make this possible. Um, the operations funding without the Vermont Agency of Human Services, uh, Office of Economic Opportunity, uh, we would not be able to um, be able to operate the shelter, basically. The cost to operate the shelter is being uh, largely funded by that state source. Our most significant service providing partner is really CVOEO, Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity, the mouthful of an organization, but the organization that provides such incredibly 
critical safety net services that um, I couldn't even list them all. But when you think of what people need to get by, CVOEO is mostly going to be there to provide that support. And in this case, for this shelter, the housing case management and navigation services, meals um, will be brought to the site. Feeding Chittenden is a program in CVOEO, so when you think of folks having all their needs met, obviously the shelter and the food are critical. But beyond that, that navigation services are the critical piece to link people to housing. Um, Turning Point Center will be operating recovery groups and peer support, um, Community Health Centers of Burlington, Mobile Medical and Mental Health Services, Safe Recovery, access to medically assisted treatment, inpatient treatment where folks find that that is what they need to pursue, uh, Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform, recovery support for those who are involved in the criminal legal system, um, BPRW, Burlington Parks Recreation and Waterfront is staffing uh, the shelter uh, with a full-time person who will provide the maintenance and, and upkeep of the, of the shelter. Uh, in addition, uh, the, the urban park rangers are a critical part of this project, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, Burlington Police Department's community support liaisons are going to be uh, on-site and connected directly to guests of the shelter. Uh, Chocolate Thunder, our locally grown um, security organization, is a critical piece of ensuring the safety of both the residents, the guests, um, the staff, and neighbors. Um, the following partners I want to just highlight were critical in referrals and, and providing their expertise and really that tough call on who, who should be uh, admitted out of those people who applied to, to stay here. The Howard Street and Community Outreach Team, the CORA Team, which is an outreach team of CVOEO, um, Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform, the Urban Rangers, I want to highlight Neil who's here today as somebody who's been intimately involved in this process and the tough decisions around how to sort of decide and vet people for, for staying here. Um, the Safe Harbor Clinic and again the CSLs uh, led by Lacey Ann Smith. We could not do this without this incredible coalition of, of the willing if you will because without that we would, um, the city on its own would not be able to pull this off. So certainly the most critical piece that we struggled with for months and months was really finding an operating partner, a managing partner that would step up, had the expertise, the skills, the, the organizational culture, the commitment to running a, a facility which was truly um, going to be a trauma-informed, sort of therapeutic environment. And CHT brings decades of experience, skilled staff, and special expertise in serving those who are experiencing homelessness. And they took incredible leadership, and I want to thank Michael for that personally for stepping up and uh, signing on to something that's going to be, we know, will have its challenges, but is there a chance to speak? Yeah. All right, great. I'll be brief and I won't go over the whole list of names of all the people we want to be thankful for, but certainly we want to be thankful for the City of Burlington's leadership, the Mayor, Cito, and the work they did as well as the state and their support for this new shelter. Um, we're eager to welcome guests and provide them with a place that is safe uh, and secure. Um, that's, the key, that's the key motto for uh, this particular community. Um, our goal as managers is to support Elmwood guests uh, in, in, in transition to permanent housing. That's the key part for us. That's the role we want to play. Uh, we continue to do that. We moved 38 folks into a place in Williston uh, last month. We can continue to do that now over the next uh, year. So we need to get folks out of shelter into permanent housing. Uh, this, of course, is absolutely necessary in transition and in the support that they're going to get. Um, let me also just, um, while everybody was thanked, let me just say that all of my staff were in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing is donuts. Um, <laughs> they were trained well. Um, so I just want to be, uh, just go over a couple of things. I think we put out some information about rules. I just want to say shelter, shelter guests will not be allowed uh, to take visitors into the shelter in order to keep the whole uh, uh, community safe and secure, um, including in the community building. Only shelter guests and direct service providers will be allowed for a period of time. We'll review that over time, but there is a, basically a front door. Uh, and you'll, you'll see a staff person there at the front door. Uh, if you wanted to come in, but certainly what we're trying to do is keep the folks who are living here and give them a place to live, right? We don't want um, people just roaming around uh, for, for, in terms of safety and security, 
but second in terms of their own individual needs and, and uh, support. So uh, this is all about uh, ensuring that they are all uh, safe uh, and secure and feel good about where they are. Um, CHC has begun the process of calling people and arranging times for them to enter the shelter. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so I was there on Friday evening when they were calling everybody. Let me say tears were rolling down the faces of the state of CHC staff as they as they talked to someone and said yes, come, we'll meet you here. I'm not going to give it a date and time, but we'll meet you here and, and we'll get you all set up. And they continued to make call after call. I think that process continued throughout the week and is continuing throughout the next a few uh, uh, a week or so. So um, that's what it's about, right? It's about meeting people's needs right where they really need to be. They need to be sheltered. They need to be housed. We know people will have individual challenges, and they're going to bring it to this community, and we're going to work uh, with them on that. But uh, that's what's key. Um, so we'll continue to sort of have conversations. We're going to continue to bring people into the, into the, into the community in a staged manner, no more than five guests you know, every 48 hours to allow orientation and transition for both staff uh, and the guests. So, so we hope that all 35 beds uh, will be filled uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks. And with that, I think, Mayor, this is yours. Thank you, Michael. Sure. Thank you and your team for the incredible compassion you bring, bring to this work sure. and uh, the huge impact you, you have on this community in, in so many ways and um, are going to have here with this new facility. Thanks. So with that, um, if there are some questions, we, we'd be happy to try to answer so it's 35 people. Um, are there any, is it all single pods? Are there some that are two people? You know, what, what does that make up? Yeah. Five couples. There's five couples. There's 25 single pods and five shelters that can accommodate two people upon their request. Good. Um, I was just curious how the selection process went and how and how people were chosen out of the 80 yeah, you said that great. applied. Who's best speak to that? So I, I, get, I, got, I, got, I chatted with staff a little bit about this. So uh, there was a group of folks. Uh, it was CHC staff, a few folks from CHC staff, folks from CBO, from Howard, uh, from a few other organizations, street worker programs. They went through the list of all the people they knew were on housed who were also applying. And people have been encouraging people to apply. So the process starts with people on the street working, uh, people working on the street, encouraging folks to apply to us. You have to do that first, right? And going through the applications and sort of making sure that, in fact, you're unsheltered. That's the first principle. And that's how people basically got in. On occasion, where if we felt that someone was a danger to the community, potentially because of some recent violent behavior, and we just sort of double-checked that, we sort of said, well, maybe not. Uh, but for the most part, there was a low barrier uh, to come in. And that process, uh, people had underwent that process over a series of a few weeks. Uh, and it was pretty intense and pretty engaging to get to that to that list and they do have another list of still people who are awaiting to come in and hopefully we can house people fast, you know. And was it first come first or from the I don't know I can't say it was necessarily first come serve. I don't know that anybody first come first yes. serve? Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's the kitchen speaking. <laughs> what about women and children? No children. No children. No children. No children. Eighteen and over. But I would add that COTS is developing new housing for homeless families and we're supporting in a significant way the funding for that project. It'll take some time to build, but it's underway right now. 16 new, permanent, supportive, affordable apartments, not shelter beds. We mentioned CSLs and Chocolate Thunder being here for safety for the guests. What role will Chocolate Thunder be fulfilling in that? Uh, overnight security. So instead of, um, you know, uh, this is not a this is not a community where you I'm sorry this is not a community where you step up and go to the door and knock on the door and say can I come in uh, so uh, so the point would be is to make sure that at some point there's security for folks and making sure that that doesn't happen. Um, and people are starting to move in tomorrow. Is that that's 
what I my understanding from what you're saying. Uh, over the next couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Have you hired all staff, and how many staff members are there total? Um, we have five on staff here, right? Thank you, Taylor. And then we have a couple of staff who spend a lot of time uh, and support uh, above above this group because we also run Harbor Place, and so we have a person who shares between that and then a whole group of folks. So I think that the value of CHT comes is that well, this is not our only rodeo. Uh, so we say it's not our first time also. So we have some people to draw upon uh, as folks need to go away or if somebody gets sick or something, uh, something else happens. So there is a little more depth in terms of support. And then there's two full-time that are providing case management, housing navigation from CBOEO, and a Parks and Rec employee who does the facility maintenance, really. And yeah, he's a great guy. Where are the CBOEO right staff? Right. Are they? Roy's here. He's working. Oh, yes. Yeah, he's out there yes. showing up. <laughs> are we be checking on folks in their shelters? I mean, we're potentially dealing with folks with substance use issues, and I know overdoses at the hotels. So was a concerning thing and um, just wondering sort of how you're hoping to mitigate that potential risk. And I don't know if we have a safety check every day. I think that if we don't see somebody in a day, we'll go and knock on their door. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. How long? <laughs> Certainly, Liam, I think there's a big distinction between um, what has been the level of services that are going to be provided here and the resources here are uh, very different than what um, the hotel program has had up until now. I mean, this is uh, from the first day that someone arrives here, they're going to start working with a uh, housing navigator to uh, work towards permanent placement and be offered, um, as you heard from a long list of partners here, a range of services that um, I think it's new that we are going to be able, able to provide this level of service in a focused way um, at a shelter. So, I would, not to disagree with the mayor, but a yes, but I would say at Harbor Place and a few others uh, where it's act like shelters, there's a little bit of that richness, certainly, in terms yeah. of that. I was talking about the more general motels. Well, the general, general motels. Yeah. So some other cities have done something similar. Have they also offered these kind of services along with the pods? So some, um, you know, this, these small shelters uh, have kind of, have really, um, a lot of cities are, are, are looking at this strategy. I was just at a uh, mayor's meeting several weeks ago, uh, talked to the um, pilot shelter, and I think they said they had provided um, shelters at this point to more than 100 uh, different um, installations. Um, so yet, the, the, physically, there's uh, many cities that are, are taking on this approach. Uh, I, do, I, I do know that some other cities are, are talking about this approach to uh, homelessness and, and um, trying to, as, as a public health approach, certainly Mayor Wu in Boston has, has been using that language and, um, uh, and, and taken in part a similar physical strategy and services strategy to, to try to address the situation there. So I, yes, this is part of uh, a national discussion and an evolving approach to, to homelessness. And can you say, what's the total cost of the project? And was it all covered by COVID funding, or that was the, the development? The total cost of the development project is 1.6 million. That that's kind of like the all-in with the solar panels and some of that other funding. And yeah, ARPA was the bulk of that funding. There were some right. additional incentives from BED, um, but uh, that's where the the capital funding was largely the city's uh, federal. Uh, allocation, the ongoing operating funding, we have some city contribution similarly from our emergency funds, but this we are very appreciative as was mentioned, the Agency of Human Services is uh, a, a major partner in, in this effort and is providing some, it's given us a two year commitment, um, uh, and I forget the total figure exactly, it's about, it comes to about a million a year to operate, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> which in part, their support comes from the fact that it is very comparable, uh, actually lower cost per night here um, on an operating basis than in other facilities. And again, um, for a very different uh, 
quality of uh, experience we believe uh, in many cases. So we think there's we're providing good value uh, per kind of government dollar here, and the HS recognizes that and, and uh, um, has really been working with us closely for months to to get to this day. So you mentioned there were 80 people that applied, 35 beds, <coughs> so like half the people that wanted us, less than half the people got a space. So I'm just wondering if there's a for CHT, do you have a plan of how quickly you want to try to move people from here to more permanent housing? Like, what your pipeline is looking like? Yeah, I can't. I, I, I can't really comment in detail on that one. I, oh, I, and I really can't say how fast we can move people through. Uh, so there's a lot of work to get folks ready to housing. There's a huge demand. We have 300 people apply to us every month. We have that many openings a year. So the demand on affordable housing is dramatic. Uh, we want to be able to sort of get people out of homelessness into, into affordable housing, but we also have to make sure that we're not sort of creating this pipeline where I'll go home get homeless for a week so I can get in real fast. We have to work with folks. Um, so I, I, I can't tell you how quickly we'll turn it over. I, th I think we want to be able to go as fast as we can. And different people, uh, depending on who they are, might be able to get different resources and be able to move to different locations. But I just don't want to jump ahead and make too much of a Commitment. Nobody should be here for long periods of time. That's that's to get that's the goal. Because the demand and the need is still there. I think I'm wondering too, but more specifically about like your like the actual capacity for the next sort of sure. rung in the we the have a, we have a hundred or so plus more homeless shelter units coming online. So that gives you a sense dedicated right over the next year or two. So people will have a chance to get housed. Uh, but you know we also have people in shelters. We also have people in, in hotel rooms. Um, and we have this location, so there's a range of folks. Everything goes through the coordinated uh, entry system. Thank you very much for reminding me as I look at you. Um, everybody goes through the coordinated entry system, so these folks will be a part of that system, and will also get in line to get new housing as part of that whole system. And that is a group of, of organizations and, and champions who are doing this work. CEO has a co-chair of that group, as well as uh, CBOEO is critical to making that work and a range of other agencies who are working together to get people through into permanent housing. So just to be clear, there is a, like, a wait list with these remaining people who have been trying to live We have the names and we know who they are. And so as we go through the process, and I know, for instance, we couldn't contact everybody. And if we can't get them over the next you know, week or so, we're going to call the next person on that list. So that makes sense. When you said you don't want people here for a long time, what would you like? Quantify that as like months or? 60, you're saying six to eight months? He says six to eight months. Okay. So I think that that probably is not unreasonable, I think. But again, I think we have the whole the whole system of folks out there. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think people should be here for too long. In terms of the shelters that are two beds, um, will that kind of be like a roommate situation where you're very close to the next person? Are they separated, you know, and then you know, how? I guess now I'm getting those interpersonal relationships I can have with you. The shelter the shelters with two beds are dedicated to um, partner to two people who would want to be in the same shelter. So there's two individual bunks that we, I can show you, but it's it's no one is gonna be uh, forced to go into a unit with someone that they didn't request to be in that unit with. Sir, good. Are there opportunities for the guests? to volunteer to do activities that will help make the community work? I, I assume that there will be, um, but I don't know if we have anything planned. So, you know, again, I think we know what we're going to do here over the next week or two or three, bringing people in. But we'll see how it goes. And if we find ourselves with a group of folks uh, who are saying, you know, they have the capacity to do something else, yeah. Uh, certainly we're going to be asking them to help clean up, time, time to go, you know, time to move out, dinner time, help us out, do all those kinds of things. So absolutely. The idea is not that people are going to wander around and be catered to. Uh, they, will, they will participate as well. They have to participate in getting themselves well. Chances are, for many of them, they'll have to participate in sort of getting their, their life in order so that they can move into permanent housing. To me, that's the biggest participation each individual brings to the community. And as each one does that, they'll become, we watch this, become a role model for others to move up. <coughs> So. Okay, um, so Samantha, Brian, and Michael, again, thank you. Thank you all for being here. There is now going to...
I think Samantha is going to lead a, a tour of uh, some of the facility for members, you know, for anyone who's interested.